Hi, I'm Gary Heinfeld, the Region 2 First Vice President. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. For your eyes only, 2023 CRE Insight in Region 2 with CCI's M's Institute's Chief Economist, Casey Conway, CCIM, MAI, CRE. We'd like to take a moment to thank all the sponsors in the region. They're scrolling on your screen right now. It's because of the support of our sponsors that we're able to bring you programming like this and we're able to provide exceptional events throughout the year. We'll begin promptly in about three minutes. Thank you. Thanks again to all our chapter sponsors. Our webinar for your eyes only is about to begin. Hello, everybody. My name is Helen Chong, and I'm the Regional Vice President for Region 2, which comprises of 10 chapters in the states of New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, California, and Hawaii. I'm also the founder of my company, Halen Real Estate Investments in San Jose, California. Well, welcome to today's webinar for your eyes only 2023 Commercial Real Estate Insights in Region 2. We're really happy to share this webinar with everyone in the industry today for CCM Institute members, this is just one of many member benefits that are designed to help you adapt and thrive in 2023 and beyond. And I really want to thank every chapter who participated in sharing this program with you. Now, joining us today is CCM Institute Chief Economist, Casey Conway. He's going to arm you with the knowledge that will help you understand where the economy is and where commercial real estate markets may be headed specifically for our region this year. So please feel free to ask questions throughout the, using the Q&A tab. We'll be answering as many as we can at the end of the discussion. 
Now, and if you are experiencing any technical difficulties, please use the chat features to ask for help with that. And the recording and accompanying presentation will be emailed to all registered attendees. Now, Casey, welcome, and thank you so much for joining us today. I'm going to turn the show over to you now. Great. Thank you so much, Helen. Good Sound check good? You see the slides and all? Yes, we can. Great. So interesting day to be having a, a webinar, right? We have a little Fed meeting, as predicted. They raised rates. They're trying to destroy the world. <laughs> um, I'll tell you that my, my deck here today is more banking, CRE capital, and economic concentric than it is really anything particular about, about your region. We know Northern California have a little bit of a snow melt going on. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter what market you're in, how good your market is, or what property type. If we lock up capital and, and do and continue doing what the Fed is doing, um, we're in for a world of hurt. So uh, as an industry, as the Institute, as our affiliate with realtors, we really need to be raising our hands and screaming <laughs> at Washington to make sure they understand that there's no need to worry about 1031 exchanges if we don't have transactions because there's no capital. So this one's a bit of a downer, but I, I do have a good closing slide, I hope, for you. So here's my standard disclaimer to protect the Institute in Region 2 here. Uh, so here's our free our eyes only. We actually want it for everybody's eyes. Um, but you know, really what happens to commercial real estate when the Fed breaks the economy? And so uh, we love the James Bond movie themes. I was a great James Bond fan. Um, so hopefully some of these will resonate here uh, going through it. So this first slide here, slide four, it's really inflation versus a banking crisis versus a debt ceiling crisis, all three of them. And what they all mean is what I've been preaching, you know, for quite a while here is, you know, we were all taught that, that real estate is all about location, location, location. What I've learned over my career is now it's LTC, location, timing, and capital. And the timing and capital availability are incredibly challenging right now. And so it doesn't matter how good your market is, what property type you have, what tenants you have, what underwriting you've done, how conservative it is. If we don't have capital and we're in this timing environment, it's very challenging. I was about ready to pull the rest of my hair out yesterday watching the, the bank meltdown. And I think after the rate increase today, what we saw yesterday, we're going to see play out again tomorrow or this afternoon. So I have a few things here. So at the top there, uh, there my, my son and our special uh, service dog is Charlie the Beagle. Uh, sometimes he'll sit there on my presentations and look him over and he just shakes his head saying, this is, this is awful. Let me go chase something that bur burrows in the ground. But maybe we should just leave it all to a Beagle to snout out uh, what, what's all going up and come up with an alternative strategy. And then Dr. No on the right, we need a Dr. No on the FOMC committee to say, no more interest rate hikes. The demand destruction, the economic destruction is well underway. So three things on the bottom there of slide four. On the left, this is a graphic of the Fed rate increases over, over different cycles. The red on the left there, that's our one last year through this year. This cycle of rate hikes 10 times in a row with no pause is the steepest and fastest in the history of our central bank. And that's why things are blowing up. It's worse in the 70s, worse than the 80s. Um, and then if you look in the middle, the Fed thought it could make all this better by uh, looking at its total assets. The Fed doesn't make anything. It doesn't sell anything. It calls Treasury and they print money. And they add it to his balance sheet. And they've added over $9 trillion to his balance sheet. And today in the, in the meetings, they're talking about next, if they, if they pause, they're going to go to work on the balance sheet. So they're going to pull back money supply. They're going to dump assets into the market. Uh, this is the worst Fed we've ever had. And I had a front row seat for five years uh, during the last time, 2005 to 10. And then on the right there, many of you know, I think we have a monopoly central bank. And if you've played monopoly, go look at rule number 11. Rule number 11 says if you play the game so long and all the paper currency is used up and you need to keep playing, what do you do? The banker may issue new money, just cut up slips of paper and reprint. That's what the Fed is doing. And that's the backdrop of everything that is, is going to challenge us here through the rest of this year and into next year. All right. So the Fed has just been moving from crisis to crisis, printing money. And so on the left side there, I, I just put, we all get it. Higher interest rates equal lower values for our commercial real estate and everything with a fixed rate investment. That's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank. 
It's what happened to First Republic. Is what was playing out yesterday. All these banks that were holding uh, treasuries, five, 10 year treasuries that the Fed encourages them to do. They're at a fixed rate. They're at three, sub 4%. Interest rates now are well north of that. They got to be marked to market. Mortgages that you didn't get sold to Freddie and Fannie, they're all sub 4% at rates that are now six and a half and seven. They've all got to be rebalanced. Commercial real estate, construction loans, and mini firm loans, the CMBS market. You'll see in a minute, we have $1.5 trillion of commercial real estate loans that have to be refinanced over the next 18 months in this environment that were underwritten to refinance in an environment that was around a four to four and a half percent interest rate environment. We have huge, huge headwinds ahead of us. So what's the Fed going to do now? Are they going to take us over 10 trillion in printed money, 15 trillion, 20 trillion? Why is that an important question? Look at here on slide six. So what you'll see on the left there is you can see the increase in the Fed funds rate. So how quickly that's raised the red bar. You can look at what's happened with interest rates on the blue line on the bottom. In the graphic in the upper right, that's the increase in our, in our uh, interest on our debt. And it has tripled. It's gone from about $250 billion a year to now $640 to $50 billion a year in additional interest rate charges because of the Fed rate increases. And this ripples massively through the economy. And why we really need to be concerned with that is this, this uh, slide on slide seven. Look at who holds our debt and who we're going to ask to bail us out and fund more of our printed money. So many of us think it's China. Japan, number one at over a trillion dollars. United Kingdom at 650 plus billion. You put Japan and the United Kingdom together and they're almost double what China holds. You put those three together, if we don't have Japan, China, and United Kingdom buying our debt, funding our fiscal irresponsibility, what do we do? We're about to find out as a fiat currency and what that means for every asset, whether it's a commodity, whether it's real estate, whether it's a company or a stock investment, this is why we need to be concerned about this. And we're one of those asset types that is directly Im impacted in a huge part of our economy. Housing is 40% of, of our economy. Commercial real estate is almost another 20%. Small business is 40% wrapped into with commercial real estate as well. So this is why this matters. This is what the Fed's not paying attention to um, and, uh, and why we need to be worried. Here's another one, the new term that's emerged just in the last 30 days that nobody was talking about in December or January or February or even March with Silicon Valley bank failure. It's the de-dollarization. And so we now have countries like uh, Brazil and Russia and India and China coming together to create their own uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency to basically undermine our dollar. And as the reserve currency, the benefit for us is every commodity like energy and oil is priced in our currency. So we get the benefit, we get the discount. So here's a, a timeline from uh, Visual Capitalist does a great job on this. You can see our strength started really 1920s and 1940s uh, with coming out of World War II. 1970s, Nixon took us off the gold standard and we took a hit. 60s, you know, we were we were still strong. Then look at the right there. What's happened from the 80s all the way to you know 2022? And look at the volume of Chinese and Russian trade in the yuan uh, against us. This is happening. And when people you know hypothecate, can the dollar ever not be the reserve currency of the world? It's happening, and it's our fiscal irresponsibility, it's our monetary policy by the Fed that is further undermining and eroding us. And that directly affects our industry and the value and the financing of commercial real estate. So this is why we need to care. All right. So we now have a banking crisis that results from Fed hikes. And so until March 10th, it was all about inflation. And the week before Silicon Valley Bank failed, Chairman Powell was out there talking about we need to go with 50 rates, basis point rate hikes again. Then Silicon Valley fails and they realize that they never asked the question after eight, nine interest rate hikes, what is the impact on banks' balance sheets? How are they holding up? They never asked that question. That's banking 101 that they teach. And so they didn't go to the bank supervision and say, hey, what's happening? You know, are they have too many fixed rate investments. They're going to have to be marked to market. Are they going to have to be recapitalized? It is almost inconceivable to me that we have a Fed that wasn't asking that fundamental question. And the line across the top there, which is the held to maturity assets and the available for sale, look at what was going on. And what happened on March 10th? 
complete collapse. And so then we had after that, we said, well, it's a one and done. Now we're going to go to First Republic and, and on further. So I want to introduce you to a new term. This is critically important for your brokerage businesses and your companies. It's called CDARS, C-D-A-R-S. What the heck is CDARS? Um, am I crazy again? Yeah, I'm, I'm crazy, but I'm going to give you something that's of value. CDARS is a program that's over two decades old. It was created by the FDIC to allow big borrowers that need to accumulate, say, cash for payroll that's well above $250,000 limit. It used to be $100,000 before the 2008-09 crisis. It allows someone to put a billion dollars in a bank, but not be at risk of losing you know, 75% of that. And so uh, what it does is it allows a bank to take your billion dollars or your 100 million or your 10 million, and they spread it out in $250,000 increments to up to 3,000 participating FDIC insured banks. The banks don't want to do that because they want to hold the assets so they can lend that money out. They tell developers you need to have more deposits with them. And uh, so the developer blindly goes along or you and your brokerage business goes along to have that banking relationship. And the bank has undermined you when if every bank in Silicon Valley had put all of those big depositors in the CDARS program, there would have been zero hit to the FDIC fund. So what I'm telling you is if you have a banking relationship and you have over $250,000 to make payroll or handle a transaction or the escrows, make sure your bank knows that you want to be participating in the CDARS program and have your uh, total accumulated assets that exceed $250,000 spread around other banks in 250,000 increments. And guess what? You can still have that great banking relationship with that one bank and it's seamless to you and you're fully protected. And no one's probably spoken candidly to you or our brokerage industry, not even NAR has told us about this. And we should absolutely have this on our radar screen. This is the number one banking protection recommendation I can, I can give you at this point in time. And I tell you, the minute you get off of this webinar, you know, speed track to your bank before they close at four or whatever time they do and, uh, and talk to them about the CDARS program if you've got accumulated uh, payroll or escrows that are above uh, 250000 so many of you heard the Federal Reserve on April 28th, they issued a report on their examination of the Silicon Valley bank failure. And what they concluded was it wasn't a bunch of dumb bank executives. In fact, the bank executives did exactly what the San Francisco Fed allowed. They allowed for the first time in my 30 year career for one industry or you know, one company to accumulate or to do all of their banking and lending with one bank. We don't do that. We have a program called SNICs in the bank world. It's called Shared National Credits. And so just like General Motors or Ford or the auto industry or the en energy industry, it is prohibitive to have one bank, bank the whole energy industry, the whole auto industry, or all of Procter & Gamble or all of Ford, GM, or Tesla, they have to share it across other banks. So if something happens, it doesn't totally um, crater that industry. For the first time, uh, since I go back in 20, 25 years, the San Francisco Fed allowed the venture capital industry to be completely banked by one bank under the watch of the San Francisco Fed, which Janet Yellen as treasury was the former uh, San Francisco Fed president. It was a complete failing of bank supervision along with the CDARS program. So the Fed kind of fell on their sword a little bit and they said, yeah, we didn't fully appreciate the two red arrows there in the center of slide 11. We didn't fully appreciate the extent of the vulnerabilities of Silicon Valley supervisors. They didn't identify vulnerabilities. They didn't take sufficient steps to ensure the Silicon Valley Bank fixed those problems quickly enough. It, this went back one to two years of the San Francisco Fed and bank regulators identifying these things and doing nothing. And that's what's happening in the market right now as we look beyond Silicon Valley to First Republic and yesterday through all the community banks, we're seeing these same problems in our local community and regional banks. This is a complete failing on bank supervision. And as an industry, if this goes un unchecked and this goes in, in through our a complete com uh, community banking system, you'll see in a minute, I calculate we've got 200 to 300 walking dead banks, community and large regional. We even have some in the top 10 banks in this country that have a profile that's just like First Republic that could be gone next week. We're a week away from those. And so I'm going to give you another tool to look at, the Texas ratio, to make sure it's not your bank. So this is, this is really more about protecting you and your business today. So here's the report. You can go read it. The link is there. 
So then what happened um, on, on Monday morning and yesterday? So at 8.30 in the morning, Jamie Dimon's on CNBC and Bloomberg, and he says, the banking crisis is over and the system is very stable. And by noon, we had a complete failing and, and just fall off in all of the regional banks. Look at PacWest Bank, Bank, Bank Corp in your region or Western Alliance. PacWest was down 27%. It was almost a run on the bank. Western Alliance, my friends in Hawaii, Bank of Hawaii, great bank, well run, down over 10% because it was this bank run, just like what happened on Silicon Valley Bank, people don't know what's happening. And part of what is attributable is Janet Yellen, who said as recently as two weeks ago, that there isn't a broad backstop for all banks on their deposits. It's just for the too big to fail. And so capital is leaving our staple community banks because they think if they fail, the only place that the deposits are insured is at too big to fail banks. And so here's another failing with Treasury and the Fed. And, and uh, I've been listening to uh, Jay Powell's uh, press conference. Not one question on this, not one statement of assurance on him that guess what? We basically have to backstop deposits, period. Or if they just put everybody in the CDARS program, we wouldn't have this problem. Um, so capital is locking up uh, and it's elevating refinance risk. So I'll give you uh, my two awards. So my barbecue sauce award is back for Jamie Diamond. Uh, nine o'clock, I sent him. Uh, a graphic and a coupon for a, a, a jar of our Red Shoe Economics barbecue sauce, which for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, it's our polite way of calling BS on something. And, uh, and we're packaging it in the back of our, of our bottle says, Red Shoe barbecue sauce, uh, no calories, prevents cancer and cures COVID. And on the front side, it says, I'm the Red Shoe economist. This is all barbecue sauce, it's BS. So if you don't believe me, there's a book, I've got a reading recommendation. This is your reading recommendation before the weekend and the next bank failure. It's called The Lords of Easy Money, How the Federal Reserve Broke the American Economy by Christopher Leonard. He's a journalist. This book's phenomenal. It's a 300 page read. Unfortunately, he has no pictures. I told him he needs to put pictures in the next edition, but he's spot on. And this is, this is telling you what I've just told you. He published this book at the end of last year. And the Fed has not even heard of it. When I did my briefings to them the last few weeks, they hadn't even heard of this book, just like they hadn't heard of Silicon Valley Bank's 10K report in mid-January, which said, we're, we're essentially insolvent. Our forward guidance is we're insolvent. And the Fed and the analysts did nothing for two months. All right. So here's slide 13. Eric Rosengren, who was a vice chair at the Fed when I was there, really smart, very talented, very candid speaking individual. Um, he's on his, in his outside the Fed now. Look at this quote from yesterday. Large regional banks, regionals, are showing stress like PacWest and uh, Western Alliance. Their stock price is falling significantly. Despite insurance ceilings need to be raised or eliminated. He's spot on for our community bank health. This steady attack on regional banks is destructive to financial markets and ultimately our economy. This is yesterday. And this is one of the, really the most talented people I respect from my time in the Fed that's still out there, this isn't just my crazy thoughts here. Um, so uh, I don't, don't know what's going on in this Fed, but there are people that are that are really sounding the alarm that we need to be worried about. So here's the thing I talked about in Boston. Some of you have heard me talk about it. It's called the Texas ratio. So the Texas ratio is something that goes back to the 1980s. If you have gray thinning hair like me, uh, you know what this is. It goes back to the SNL crisis, the uh, oil patch, and what we were trying to do is figure out what's the next thrift that's going to fail. And is there one simple ratio that we can look to to predict that? And so this ratio was created. And what it essentially does is it, it takes all the risk weighted assets that have to be marked down, And it looks at them as a percentage of your capital. Banks only have 10% capital. They're 90% leverage. And it says if that ratio gets anywhere near 10%, you're insolvent. You probably fail. So this ratio is still maintained today by lending tree. So the link's down there at the bottom. And so here I ran on a, on a nationwide basis. You can run your individual state. You can run by size of your bank, a billion above or 10 billion or 50 billion, 100 billion. And what you can see is look at these ratios. Look at, it at, the, at, at the top, you know, like Nano Bank or Patriot Bank. You know, you're, you're sitting there with 23 to 25% taxes ratios. That means you have risk assets that are worth less than two and a half times your capital. You are a walking dead bank that needs to be shut down. And there are two to 300 that are in this category right now. And these aren't all small banks, these are big ones. So what I encourage you to do 
is go look up the Texas ratio in your state for your banks and see if the bank, a bank that you're involved with in a transaction or that you're doing business with has a Texas ratio that's above five. Because if it's below three, you're pretty well capitalized, your balance sheet's good. Um, if it gets to five, you need to begin raising capital. And banks can't raise capital right now. Nobody wants to own bank stocks. And if it's anywhere near 10, you're a walking dead bank and you should be shut down. And on a Friday afternoon, it's highly likely over the next several months, by the end of the year, that many of these two to 300 banks will be shut down. And the Fed's attitude is, so what? I literally had a discussion with a senior prominent Fed official that said, we have 5,000 banks. So what if we lose another 500 or 1,000 banks? It's too many to supervise. Well, here's why it matters. In many of your locations in your smaller markets, it's a community bank. It's a billion or two billion in size. It's the only bank in that market that's funding you and at a local level. And so it's not that we have redundancy in San Francisco or LA or Honolulu, um, you know, but you know, New Mexico, think about Taos. You probably have on one hand, the number of community banks or credit unions that can actually fund you. So if the Fed says, oh, they fail, we wipe them out. Who cares if Taos, New Mexico has no banking? That's the arrogance of the attitude that we have in this Federal Reserve System. And it's our community banks and our credit unions that have been funding us, that know our local markets, that understand our real estate. And so that's why we as an industry, as the Institute and as an affiliate of NAR, we need to be absolutely almost stampeding on Washington and the Federal Reserve to you know, really do like Eric Rosen is doing right now and saying, we got to grab you by the lapels and get you to understand what you're doing. And for the Fed to raise interest rates another quarter point today is absolutely insanity. They will be having to cut and unwind most of this in a full recession here within six months. All right, so there's the Texas ratio. Making it worse. I'm full of good news today. I should go get my grumpy, grumpy hat on right now. So look at banks with problems with fixed rate mortgages. So banks originate mortgages to sell or securitize with Freddie or Fannie. And so many of them have been trapped with mortgages they were originating at the end of last year, refi applications, home equity lines, all at fixed rate type deals, and they got stuck. Look at Wells Fargo Bank up there. Uh, residential mortgages and a percentage of their equity. Wells Fargo Bank West, 740, seven and a half times their capital. Look at others in Colorado and California that you've got there. Look at First Bank, First Bank of Colorado. Great bank. I, was, I lived in Colorado when it got started. And my dad was one of the early investors. And look at what they're trapped with. And if they're forced to mark these to market, they're gone. And, it, and to those of you in region two with, you know, in Colorado, how important is a First Bank of Colorado to your economy? It's bleeping important to you guys. Um, so look at some of these. Uh, so it's not just the commercial real estate. It's not just treasuries, but it's these banks that are stuck with mortgages that they can't unload because they're at 4% money. And Freddie and Fannie says, well, we'll buy them, assuming they're a 65 or 7% net yield. So you're looking at a 30 to 50% haircut on the value of those mortgages. And if they sell them at those discounts, their capital is gone. That's why this stuff matters so much. And uh, things like liquidity risk. This is job one as a bank supervisor is to look at liquidity risk. All right. So what does this mean? So I couldn't believe this. Risk uh, RMA and the American banker read an article that says, are CRE losses the next thing to impact banks? It's a duh, absolutely, because many of them are construction loans that got to go into permanent. Many of them are stuff that they were accumulating for securitization. And if we have to now mark those from their value at a four and a half to five capital rate to more like a six to eight, that's 25 to 40 percent of their value is gone. And can the bank take that kind of hit to capital? And can the borrower withstand refinancing and the debt service coverage going from, uh, you know, we used to call it, we call it a debt yield, but the interest only. The term interest only is what amount of debt can the NOI support as a ratio um, in the current interest rate environment? So we used to underwrite to 10. We said, okay, if you've got NOI that can service 10% interest only, you're okay. Nine or 10%. Today, it's insane what we're looking at. So here's what happened to First Republic. Um, they became the second largest bank failure. So we've had three of the largest bank failures in our history in the last 45 days. The biggest was Washington Mutual during 2008 and 9. And so um, we need to really be concerned about it. And there's some big, big regional, some in the top 10 that I fear have the same profile as a First Republic bank. And that's part of what I do is I look at these profiles. I brief the Fed. I brief banking entities on what's ahead for them. So 
here's the one number I want you to think about. You'll, you'll be up all night long. You'll have heartburn. Take a, take a bunch of tums tonight. $1.5 trillion. That's the amount of commercial real estate loans that face refinancing in the next 18 months. They're a construction loan. They're a mini perm. They're a, uh, you know, a CMBS loan. $1.5 trillion. And if those things drop 25 to 50% in value, the impact is that all of the capital in one third of our top 20 banks is gone. 1.5 trillion. That's what the Fed didn't connect the dots to today with another, with another, I'm getting choked up over this number. 1.5 trillion. That's the number I want you to think about. That's what we in the Institute with NAR and the Realtors and our industry need to be screaming at the top of our lungs to our Congress people, to the Fed, this is the dot they're not connecting. This is what is going to potentially decimate our industry the end of this year and into next year if we don't get some relief. All right, CRE values. So I look at the commercial property price indices. You can look at Green Street, which is the best stuff. I like RCA or CoStars, good sponsor of your region, that do their own CPPI index. And, and all of them show the same thing. Look at the three-year, the one-year, the three-month. We're seeing the decline in commercial real estate values. Last year, we saw the decline in NOI, which caused values to drop 10 to 15% because expenses were growing at three times NOI. So the NOI went down, same cap rate, you lose 10 to 15% of your value. Now what we're seeing is the discovery of cap rates going from four and five cap rates to six, seven, and eight cap rates is wiping out, is wiping out the values in all of our assets, whether you're the, a great triple net industrial deal or a great multifamily deal, this is what we're facing. All right, CRE values, the next piece is coming. So TREP, they publish and they work with banks on helping them with their stress tests. So the guidance from the Fed that came out in January, late January, early February, was this year, banks have to assume to pass their stress tests that all of their commercial real estate drops in value by 40%. That's before Silicon Valley Bank. They've not amended it. So how many banks do you think have enough capital when they're 10 times, nine times leverage, they're 10% capital, 10 times leverage, have enough capital to withstand a 40% decline in commercial real estate assets. And the answer to that is, if you're a CRE concentrated bank, that means you have more than 300% of your total tier one capital, your 10% capital in commercial real estate, you're a CRE stress bank. And if those assets have to drop 40% to pass, you're out of business. And so this is the kind of insanity that we as the public need to understand. We need to understand how it affects our industry. And um, I, I will tell you that in my 38 year career, I have more anxiety and more indigestion right now of where we are than at any point in my career. And I was in Colorado in the 1970s with my dad developing uh, in Vail, Colorado with Paul Volcker and taking prime to 21%. Um, you know, I lived through the SNL crisis, the RTC, uh, was at the Fed during the 2008 and 9 crisis. I have more anxiety over what we're in right now in this Fed meeting today than anything in my 38 year career. And I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm trying to call all of us to really action, to get engaged, and we need to have our voices heard. We need to ask you know, our leadership uh, at the Institute in Chicago to really pound our fists to gnaw the realtors and say, this isn't just a housing residential thing where Lawrence June is going to tell us that the spring's still going to come this year um, and we're going to have more inventory and all the data is saying no. We are the voice. We are the experts on commercial real estate and they, and they need to re rely on us and have us help them help our whole industry and our, in our economy. So uh, Greg Liscouty, I think he needs to get some kind of award from the Institute. I put his you know, little uh, simple tool in there. He reminds us about the um, band of investment tool. How do you get a cap rate if there's no transactions? You build it up from the cost of debt and equity. He showed us in his first post, this goes back last year and he's got updated ones and more spreadsheets that help you do even more of this. So if you don't know Greg, get to know Greg. And by all means, every region needs to nominate him for some kind of a, key player hero award for bringing this to our attention in a simple tool that shows us a year ago, we could construct cap rates in the 5% range. And the cost of our capital today means we probably can't even do it below 8%. So if you don't know band of investment, you need a simple tool, reach out to Greg, this is what's ahead of us. And when we see the disconnect between buyers and sellers, this is what sellers don't understand. They think their properties are still worth 4 and 5% when we had quantitative easing. And we're now at 6 to 8% cap rates with quantitative tightening, extreme tightening. I call it QET. Quantitative extreme tightening um, is what we've got. So thank you, Greg. This is a great tool. 
All right, let's talk a little bit about inflation metrics because this is what the Fed should be paying attention to. So the producer price index and the consumer price index. So here I put the numbers and we, we've supposedly seen some release. May 11th is when we'll get the April data. And my fear is we're seeing the energy inflation back. The strategic petroleum reserve gimmick is over with. Energy prices went back above 80. They're back a little bit below because of recession concerns. But Saudi Arabia said they're cutting production. They hate America now. Um, and they're joining with other entities to sell their oil to Russia and China and India and screw America. And so when we were energy independent, and now we're not, this is really the consequence. But I think we're going to see the energy inflation come back in here and really hit us. And that's important in the producer price index because the production costs, the transportation costs, uh, everything that goes into, you'd be amazed at how much is petroleum that goes into manufacturing everything, including our smartphones and everything in a Tesla uh, on the interior is all, all made from petroleum inputs. So inflation is not gone. I'll, I'll show that in a minute. The consumer price index, May 12th, we'll get that new read. And what you can see there is food and energy are back rising quite a bit. On the producer prices, look what's happening on the inputs in food and construction. So you're looking at 10 to 20% numbers still in those items. And they're what I call the super core. So you've heard of core and non-core where they take food and energy out and say everything you spend money on, it doesn't matter. So super core is wages, it's um, food, it's shelter, and it's services. And we're a service. And all those things are running 8 to 12%. And they represent 80% of the CPI. But guess what the, the BLS and the BEA do? They change the algorithms. So if housing or food used to represent 20 or 30 or 40% of the CPI, they lower its weighting so they can say inflation went down. The gimmicks that go on in these indices would blow your minds. That's why I spend so much time reading the footnotes to kind of give you simple graphics like this. So here on slide 22 is the inflation CPI detail. So they actually have these charts and the Fed doesn't look at them when they say they're data dependent. So what they do is they break it down. So you see the red line, all items, and it looks like it's coming down because they've changed the weighting of all those others like food and shelter. So I put food on there. Look at what's happening with food prices. And then at the right, at the right there, or sorry, that was shelter. The blue one on the left is shelter. And on the right is food, food at home. That's groceries. And look what's happening to these items. I kept shelter in there, put food in there. The things that are our real world inflation, 80% of our real world inflation, they're at like 8 to 12%. And the Fed's saying, no, there's no inflation. It's coming down. It's taming. It's barbecue sauce. Here's another barbecue sauce award. So I encourage you when the CPI comes out, go, go down and click on the detail. And these graphs are already put together and they're interactive and you can click on any one of these to see what's really happening that influences you know, your region, you know, whether it's agriculture or shelter um, on all of those items. So here's the metric that the Fed should have focused on today and not raised rates. It's the JOLTS data. So JOLTS is an acronym that stands for Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. So they look at how many new openings are, there are and how many people are comfortable enough to turn over and leave their job. And many of you know, a few months back, we were seeing like 10 million uh, net openings and that's contracted greatly. And the turnover is getting worse from layoffs. And as soon as what they said, job openings dropped 384,000 in March. They weren't up a million or whatever. Layoffs and discharges increased by a quarter million to 1.8 million layoffs. This is what the Challenger Gray uh, survey tells us every month, who's laying off jobs. And it's been big in tech. Now it's in financial services. Now it's going into other services. And the decline in job openings concentrated in small businesses. These are our tenants in our retail shopping centers, in our multi-tenant office buildings, in our multi-tenant industrial buildings. It's 40% of the economy. And this is the demand destruction the Fed's been waiting to see. And by the time they quit raising rates and they see this in unemployment numbers six months from now, they'll destroy the economy. They'll destroy our industry. So this is what I point out. Reuters did a good job on a piece on this yesterday. This is the job destruction that's happening right now. And the reason it doesn't show up in unemployment is because when you get laid off and you get unemployed, you don't count as unemployed until your severance benefits run out. So it's going to take months for people to go through their severance benefits. And it doesn't necessarily have to be salary. It could just be a medical benefit. Continuation of medical means you're ineligible for unemployment and you're not counted as unemployed. All right, consumer confidence. Everything we do in our economy is about uh, psychology and confidence. In the University of Michigan, it fell to a record low uh, last year in December. It bounced back up with the strategic petroleum reserves. 
and it's plummeting again. It's the best consumer confidence, longest history, most reliable. NFIB, National Federation of Independent Business is the top. These are our small businesses. These are our tenants and it's collapsing. In December, January, February of this year, well, December last year, January, February of this year, those three months, we've had more small business failures than all of 2009. Our small businesses are getting crushed because most of their debt is variable. And so as the Fed raises rates, the variable rates go up and they're paying like 14 to 20% on their, on their debt. It might be they're putting their ongoing business on the credit card. And guess what the credit card companies are doing? So here's another warning to you. So we're a small business. We have a relationship with American Express. We put our travel on there. We float our receivables um, so we can keep going. And American Express, when I was in Boston, sent me a notice that they were reviewing our account for contraction. So we had good credit, paid on time, uh, no issues at all, doing as agreed, but they were gonna review our account. Why? They wanna restrict everybody's credit. They don't want us to take down credit because we might be trying to sustain our business and might not be able to repay it. So I called them and they said, well, if you guys just make a double payment, everything will be cool. So we make a double payment, even though we were current on everything. Guess what they did two days ago? They contracted our, our credit capacity by 50%. Perfect scores, perfect performance, greed is paid, paying our bills. That's what happened in 2009. That's what all of you in your businesses, or small business or your brokers, or even your personal accounts, these banks and these credit card entities like American Express and Visa are already embarking on viewing your accounts and trying to contract your lines of credit. That kills small business. It kills you. You may be planning, hey, I got you know 10,000 here that I can potentially use for kids going back to school you know, at the end of the summer in August, and you'll wake up in June or July and find that they've contracted that to a thousand bucks. So this is what's happening. Uh, NHAB Wells Fargo housing market index, HMI. This is maybe the worst housing recession than 2008 and nine. And my best indicator of this is this slide that I've shared with you is what's happening with builder cancellation rates. And in California, you need to pay attention to this because housing is a big doggone deal for you guys. Um, Hawaii is hard to get a house built. It's more repurposing or refixing, but um, uh, or houseboats, maybe I'm teasing. Um, you know, you know, high risk volcano, site of volcano housing. But anyway, good company like KB Homes. They pre-sold homes. They didn't do big spec inventory. So in their in their Q1 earnings release, they said we are reporting a 68% cancellation rate. So what happened is people that bought a home, contracted for a home three to six months ago, and were underwritten and approved at 4% mortgage rates are now being underwritten at six and a half to seven and they don't qualify. So that gives them an out in that home that's being completed right now goes back to KB Homes. So what is KB Homes gonna have to do with that inventory? And what do you think they do with their land inventory that they've been accumulating to build more inventory? The land values go down, they dump the land, they discount the homes to get rid of the inventory, they get mean and lean. This is what's happening in our housing industry that's totally opposite of what happened in 2008 and 9 when we built too much housing inventory because we thought everybody, you know, that, you know, was even a, a waitress could afford a half million dollar home and it was, it was all phony stuff. This is well in the written pre-sold with 10 to 20 percent down pre-approved real money stuff. So this is my most concerning metric on housing. So here's the other one for both retail and housing is how do households and small businesses with variable debt financing function? So on the right here is the, the Fed every month gives us a new report on our household debt and credit card debt. And we're breaking a record every month. We have more record household debt and we have more credit card debt than we've ever had before. And now it's at interest rates that are double what they were just 90 days ago. So how do we sustain that? How do we grow? How do we consume more? How do we buy homes? How do we buy cars? By the way, anybody want to guess what the average price of a new car is, the data just came out, $48,000. And there are only three new cars in America, two by Kia, I forget the other one, it's probably Hyundai, uh, that are under $20,000. And so what are we going to do in three to five years? Are we going to need a new cash for clunkers program? Because all our cars are wore out and the government will give us money to shred them if we go buy a new car. But we could be looking in three to five years at the median price of a new car at what a truck is today, a pickup truck, $70,000. Every element of this economy is incredibly fragile and incredibly strained by what the Fed monetary policy is doing. So to help you out, we have the site to do business uh, CREPI index. Um, we built this, introduced it in uh, Pittsburgh almost two years ago. It's very predictive. We test back tested it. 
It's a monthly indicator. We, we've had a little wobbliness in getting it out every month. We were doing it quarterly. Uh, the latest narrative I have out there is for the January data. Not all data for all these data points, our 10 windshield indicators come out at the same time. So we're smoothing that out a little bit. Um, we think here within the next 90 days, we'll really have this refined. It's an incredibly predictive index. We've offered it to the Fed. We've got individuals and entities that are very interested in following this. So this is something very powerful that the CCIM Institute created for you and your members um, uh, and through CCIM Tech and Psych to Do Business. And um, we, we, we think we can maybe share this with the realtors to help them really better understand commercial real estate. They got residential down, but I, I think we can help them with commercial. CRE trends. So here's the two big points. I pulled still from the Merging Trends 2023 report that came out end of December, early January. And it said the biggest headwind that all of us are going to face before this capital lockup is that buyers and sellers can't agree on pricing. Sellers think that their assets are worth quantitative easing numbers at four and five cap rates. And sellers say, you're crazy. Do you know what I have to pay for capital day? It's a seven or eight cap. And that's going to play out. That friction is going to play out all year and make transactions more difficult to do. So those, those courses that you took and part of your designation on the marketing skills and whatnot are really gonna become imperative. Take a refresher, take a word refresher course on, on marketing to deal with these, these type of objections. This is where that CCIM education will pay big dividends. So what all of this means is slowing transaction activity. And so here's the CMBS numbers. And all the brokers from Colliers and CBRE and every one of them have come out in their earnings and said, we see somewhere between one third and one half less transactions this year. And the CMBS came out and said, we're shut down by 80%. We've seen an 80% decline in permanent debt financing. So every construction loan that's finishing and needs to go to the permanent market or that 1.5 trillion that needs to refinance, there's no permanent market right now. We're back to 2009 when I was in the Fed and CMBS market completely shut down. And I walked over from the New York Fed to the TREP folks, and it took us about a year to figure out how to restart permanent finance in, in CRE with the CMBS market. I hope we don't do that again, but we're on the same path. And so we got to really figure out where's our capital going to come from? Who are the equity partners that you have? What's their dry powder? Is there an alternative like a credit union? Right now, the credit unions are an incredible resource uh, to help us where the banks are, are, are pulling back. Uh, the slowing transaction activity uh, again, here's the, the, the volume of activity that decreased by lender type. So in the bank world, roughly 80% of U.S. commercial real estate lending is provided by banks, by banks. And they all have assets less than $250 billion. And so look at the, the pink and the orange bars, uh, which really represent the, the pink is the CMBS. And then look at the, you know, the orange bars, which is the, the, the banks there, uh, and even the GSEs, it's shut down. And so I'm here in the Southeast United States, and I joke with some of our colleagues that, that know down here, we had a bank in North Carolina that became Nations Bank, that became Bank of America back in the 80s and 90s. And its initials were NCNB, North Carolina National Bank. And we used to joke that they were really no cash for nobody. What I would tell you is we are in an economy, we're in a Federal Reserve, we're in a monetary policy era where the acronym that they have is no cash for nobody in our economy. And I, I don't know how we navigate that. I've never encountered this, this degree with no plans. Even go back to 2008 and nine, and Chairman Bernanke was invented with, uh, real innovative with different programs like TALF and TARP. And I worked with him on all of those type things. And he knew we had to restart capital. We have a Fed that has no interest in lending or starting capital and are totally fine with a complete economic collapse, five to 10% unemployment, uh, destroying its second mandate, and as an industry, we, re we really got to speak up. All right, the other one for emerging trends is, here's the top property types, industrial, multifamily, and hotel. Uh, Boudreaux knows I talk about hotel as boo leisure. It's because of business and remote work, I can spend more time traveling to a great place and extending it really as a leisure. This will be the first time hotels don't go into a recession during a recession. Uh, industrial, multifamily, I'm gonna share, there's some real problems um, that we face ahead of us. So here's the office, y'all know that I'm a big believer in the Castle Systems back to work barometer. We're, we're a year and a half open and we can't get people to go back to work 50% of the time. And when tech companies and financial service companies like Jamie Dimon say everybody's got to come back to work, they basically give him some signal from a, a hand on my finger here and they go get another job. And we're not going. Um, so uh, remote work is here to say, this is the indicator. The only place people were going back to work more than 50% is Texas. 
uh, although Chicago climbed back up over 50%, surprisingly. Maybe it's because the heat uh, and air conditioning is free there versus at home, so it's a way to save money. Um, we're seeing on the office buildings, big institutional money. PIMCO, $1.7 billion from Seattle to New York on office buildings, it said, we've already lost 20%. We know we're gonna lose another 40%. We're dumping the office. So these assets are gonna have really severe repricing. But I'll share with you on slide 35. This is an example. I keep looking for deals. And my, my favorite resource, those of you that don't know about Connect CRE, those that you do, I tip my hat to you. Um, they, every week, are telling the stories about deals that are getting done, how they're getting done, the structure that's, get, that's being used, and who the lenders are. So this is the former PGA headquarters down in West Palm Beach. Um, and I highlighted in blue, this is the recipe that can get done. First of all, it's a small deal. It's not a 50 or $100 million high-rise office building. Um, so it's small. Number two, it's local. They use a local bank, a local entity. The investor, Blue Water Advisors, local. The bank knew them. The community knows them. They're a tried and, and proven entity. Um, they were in one of the strongest office markets in West Palm Beach where everybody's been moving out of New York and moving down there. So this local entity, local bank, local buyer knows what's going on. And um, the other thing is they knew that they still had to structure in a credit enhancement. And the credit enhancement was the PGA coming back and agreeing to lease back the building or pay rent on it for two years to help the bank feel confident and not have an impaired loan that they can get over this two-year period with the Fed. That's how deals are getting done. That's how an office building is not high-rise. It's not big. It's local, local, local with a credit enhancement. So if you're trying to do office, this is a great example. I also encourage you, if you don't uh, look at Connect CRE, it's, it's uplifting. It's where I go at the end of the day to try to feel good that there's still transactions that are occurring out there. All right, retail. So we all know the store closings. We still have store closings. Uh, this graphic shows some of the top, you know, 20 retailers. Um, but look at the names. I mean, Starbucks and Walmart and Walgreens are all still closing stores. And what they're doing is it's not omni-channel. Omni-channel was having the technology to sell in multiple platforms. Today, it's about opti-channel. Of all those options, how do I optimize? What stores can I get rid of? How can I maximize the online uh, sales opportunity with fewer people, fewer redundant inventory, and all that type stuff. And so the key things are, um, uh, you know, small is the new big. And big, big retailers and department stores are shrinking into things like closed bed, bath, and beyond. They're going from 80,000 square feet to 20,000 square feet options. You in Hawaii, you're, you're seeing this as well, that you can't build a new department store. People can't, even at Alamoana Mall with Macy's, they're trying to shrink that box, shrink the number of people, shrink the amount of inventory. And the smaller works very, very good. And they're finding places like airports and really good convention hotels where they're putting more and more retail. It works really, really well. And your uh, Kamehameha Schools uh, understands this very well and are utilizing their hospitality assets. The other thing is working is grocery. Any retail that's attached to grocery, look at the biggest retailers here and look at how many of them are grocery, Walmart, Costco, Kroger, I think, I think uh, Costco or Amazon is, is, is there growing in, the, in Hawaii. Target, Publix here in the Southeast, all the other, other Germany, AG, but anything with grocery works and can attract capital. Pension money will do small grocery anchor deals all day long right now. They'll stretch, they need to place capital. They've already raised their capital selling life insurance or annuities. And uh, so they've raised that capital last year at 4%. So they can lend at 5%. Or, let, or six, even less. They got to place that money versus lose it because they've got these sold financial products, unlike a bank. The other thing that's working is dollar stores. Believe it or not, one in five Americans now buy their groceries at a dollar discount store. They're easy to put up um, unless the local government doesn't, doesn't like them. Um, uh, they're not cost intensive. They're cash machines. Um, and this is where people are going. Half of the floor space in a dollar discount store is now is, is refrigerated. It's where people are going to get just in time vegetables or fresh milk or the beer or wine or whatever. So um, the dollar discount stores is a retail opportunity. And small is the new big. Here's examples of Macy's and Nordstrom's and Bloomingdale's all getting out of big boxes in their big mall stores and moving into smaller stuff that's near the mall, that's near the interstate, that's near in the great neighborhood location because they, they can't afford these costs. They got to shrink as well. And they got a big e-commerce warehouse that can supply all this stuff without redundant inventory. So small is the, is the new big. 
Um, so think, surprisingly, all the Bed Bath & Beyond stores in the bankruptcy, there are like five bidders lined up for every one of these stores that are being closed. All right, the other thing is we know about uh, workforce migration. You know I love the U-Haul. That's gonna be interesting to see if any of us were able to afford to move when we get the new report next January. But I thought I'd point out here, CBRE did some good work. The dark blue here are areas where people and workforce are still migrating to. And so California, I know you get tired of hearing everybody's moving out of California, but look at the dark blue areas, particularly Southern California, uh, North, look at Reno in Nevada, um, look at you guys in Arizona and even um, uh, up into New Mexico. There's still workforces moving in there, whether it's the space economy, whether it's mining, whether it's EV battery manufacturing, you've got a lot of stuff that's going on that's still bringing in. And the value of the CCIM is being able to translate to a bank, to a credit union, to a capital source, that you're not that stereotypic story that everybody's leaving California, I've redlined California, I'm not lending there. You need to be able to tell that story. So this is a graphic here, great work by CRE, uh, CBRE. The dark blue is where it's outperforming and, and workforce and population migration are going in. What's working industrial? So we think everything's working in industrial and it's not. So here's another one I grabbed out of Connect CRE. This is what's working. And we at Red Shoe, we advise, um, some big, big merchant de industrial developers. And what they've been finding is it's harder and harder to lease or sell a half million to million square foot new warehouse or to get the financing for it. And what they're finding is what's working is companies have said this. We don't know if we want to take on another half million or a million square feet. So let's see if we can find a smaller nugget. Um, let's see if we can find 100 to 250,000. And so this example um, that just occurred in South Carolina, north of Charleston, 120,000 square feet local entity. Uh, it's even not the, you know, the big names like a Coca-Cola or PepsiCo or Home Depot or Amazon. These are local entities or regional entities um, that are doing packaging, that have warehouse needs, that are still growing and are well capitalized. And so what's working in industrial is a smaller nugget, a smaller box that maybe has expandability. And uh, they're taking a time out. They don't want to take a big risk on a half million to million square feet and guess wrong right now with their capital. So even in industrial, we're seeing some pivoting of what's what's really working. Um, Space Nomics, this is another opportunity uh, we think is going to be big in Long Beach. I was recently out there and spoke uh, at the crew meetings and was just blown away at what's happened to all the former Boeing space at, at uh, Long Beach. that has been repurposed into small tech companies that are engaged in uh, the space industry. Uh, building, manufacturing, coding, uh, space satellites are being launched out of Long Beach. This is our next big economy. And we at Red Shoe are working on a paper that we'll hopefully publish August, September, probably September, that will look at how significant this is and what states and what markets. Um, you know, you've got Florida that's going to do 90 launches this year, more than any state's ever done. California is important. Texas is important. Uh, Tucson, Arizona, and Arizona is huge. You've got over 16 major space aero defense uh, manufacturers in there. Uh, Nevada, you're very important as well. So uh, this is an important area. Pay attention to. We're going to hopefully give you and arm you with a lot um, to engage. And we're leasing space. I was just down at Cape Canaveral in Florida. Blue Origin has over four and a half million square feet of space satellite manufacturing facilities under development to do the 90 launches. It's, a, it's just amazing. The same thing in Texas and Arizona. Uh, you know, if Tucson. If you if you get a mayor that would allow you to build some roads, you could probably do a lot more. But we all have these NIMBY and local political issues, but we need to help tell them this good story. We need to let them know this is good in, this is good industry data. This is the good type of jobs they want. So I'll conclude on this. I actually do have a good message here, um, but I want you to pay attention first to a few CRE metrics. So the first I told you about the Texas ratio. You need to know the Texas ratio, the bank that you do banking with, that holds your escrow accounts, um, that is on the other side of transactions you're involved with. You want to make sure this is not a bank that's got something near a 10% and is going to mess up your business or not be there for a closing. So please, please, please check your banking relationships out with their Texas ratio. CRE concentration. What does that mean? This is actually a technical term. When I was at the Fed, we developed this guidance. The two ratios are 100 and 300%. So banks are restricted from having 100% of their tier one capital. That means their 10% equity in land loans, in land investments, and 300% for all real estate. And they call commercial real estate mortgages, land, and what we consider commercial. And so you can go to the New York Fed and you can look up um, whether you're a CRE concentrated bank. If you're a bank with 300% or more commercial real estate and you're in this situation, um, if those have to be written down by 50%, half or all of your capital is gone. 
and you're a walking dead bank. The other one I want you to pay attention to is when the finance mechanisms and metrics will work again. So many of you have heard the term SOFR. It's um, the overnight funding rate that was created by Fannie Mae to replace LIBOR that, that pretty much went away a year ago. And um, so imagine how stable LIBOR was. It's what we did for construction loans. You know, it was never anywhere near 1% for, for years and years, almost decades. And SOFR replaced that. And so for today, is it almost 5%? In fact, I think this morning it hit 5%. So imagine your variable construction interest rate variable loan is at almost 5%. The two years at 4%, the 10 years at 3.5%. The 10-year treasury is essentially irrelevant. Nobody's lending at 3.5%. That index is ridiculous. They've just increased the spread. And when you have LIBOR, the variable rate index, at 5%, this economy is shut down. Everything is inverted. Think about yield curve inversion. This is finance rate inversion. And until that SOFR comes back down to something like say, 2%, 18 months ago, it was a quarter of a percent. And so this is very concerning. And when you see SOFR or you see the short-term interest rates, two year, one year, at, at numbers that are really high and inverted from the long-term, it tells you the market is freaked out. It doesn't believe in the near term. And they, they generally that means one to two years. And they're hopeful the long-term will come, come around. And so the other thing is pay attention to what's happening with CPI and PPI. These are really telling us what's happening with inflation, but go look at the super core. Go look at the wages, go look at the food, go look at the shelter costs and go look at the services. And as long as those are in an eight to 12% range, we're in deep trouble on inflation. And all the Fed and BLS and BEA are doing is they're changing the weighting to make those entities, the WFSS, that are really high, they're reducing their weighting to make it look like inflation went down. Don't get conned by that. Um, the other one is VIX. I, I talked to many of you about the, the volatility index by the Chicago Board of, uh, of Equities and Commodities. And it used to be a really reliable indicator to see when the market was really freaked out. And so above a 30, and the VIX has been as high as 60 to 80, per 80 on its rating, uh, is an indication that the market's freaked out and to get the hell out of the market. Sorry, that economic term. Get the hell out of the market. That's an economic term that most economists like Mark Sandy and uh, and whatnot won't use anymore. But it's at 17. And so if you look at these two charts I've got down there, the left one shows that we were just under 18 yesterday and the dark shade one has three metrics. The red line, which is hard to read. You get this from Reuters. They did a great job graphing it. They put the, the Fed rate increases, the red line. See that skyrocketing. The orange tan there, uh, shading, that's the, the bank index and, and what, what's happening with the banks. And they're collapsing and they were collapsing yesterday. And then the white is the VIX. And so if you have Fed raising rates off the charts like they've never done, you have the banking index collapsing and locking up capital, how can the VIX be at something like 17? The historical average is 18. And 30 is where it should be, where there's a lot of risk in the market. So I, I will tell you today, I'll confess, forget everything I ever told you about following the VIX. I don't understand it. I don't know who's manipulating it, but the VIX is not a good indicator. So what I will close on is the following. My son, Luke, is there. We were recently um, uh, enjoying good ice cream cones. We were down in uh, spring break and he's smiling and he's enjoying his ice cream cone. The best advice I can give you today, this is a really tough time. This may challenge you more than 2008 and 2009. It may challenge you more than oil patch, you guys were very involved in that, particularly Colorado. Um, this may challenge you more than the 1970s if you were around. Um, so I, I don't have a fix. We have a very incompetent Fed that doesn't know what they don't know. They're destroying the economy. So before they destroy all of it, go enjoy an ice cream cone like Luke. Uh, it's a, it, you know, it's nice sunny spring day here in, in the Southeast, um, but uh, this is a tough time. And we need in our industry, and we are the leaders on commercial real estate, knowledge, education, and we should be the source that NAR leans on to really help them communicate to Washington and the Fed about the destruction. So that's really my big message. It doesn't matter how good your market is. And there's lots of good markets. The fundamentals are good. It doesn't matter who your tenant is, that everything is upside down because of the Fed. And there's not an easy fix to that until they realize how, how, how bad they are, even their own report you know, that, that cast blame on them didn't didn't have enough to say. So I will stop there, pay attention to those metrics and enjoy an ice cream cone. And I'll see if we have any questions. I'll, I'll shoot it back to, uh, back to you, Helen. All right. Well, thank you so much, Casey. That was a lot of information. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I know we do have quite a few questions here. I'm gonna just 
um, ask some of them really quickly. Uh, given the last time the 10-year note was below 2% was 1942, we just went through a 13-year period of artificially low interest rates. The average for the 30-year mortgage is actually 7.5% since 60s. Why do you not view this as a rate normalization exacerbated by massive government spending? And we are not the only ones spending. Yeah, so that's part of the problem. You know, when you run up all this deficit stuff, when the Fed prints $9 trillion of money and Congress does another 12 or 15 trillion, and we're a fiat currency, and you put $21 trillion in the economy that's paper monopoly money, you create inflation. And so these rates are really a reflection of that fiscal irresponsibility. And what's the solution is to do more of it. So that, that's a very good type point. We should be. When I bought my first house, I was a 10.5% mortgage in Phoenix, Arizona in 1985 or 86. Um, and I was ecstatic to have something below 10, right around 10%. So we're not used to it, but you can't just move rates from quarter to over 5% in essentially a year and not destroy the economy. We're just, everything was underwritten for cheap free money and now it's expensive money. And how do you transition without a lot of destruction? It, it's gonna be a lot of destruction. And it's just that a lot of people just not used to it. Um, right. And let me go to another question by Janice. In your opinion, what range and for how long does the inflation number need to be month over month for the Federal Reserve to pause from the 10, uh, 10 interest hikes? And once they pause, how long do they take to reverse course historically? Yeah, so great question. The Fed had all the cover to pause today. CPI was down. They changed the algorithm. PPI was down. Everything they needed to say, time out. And, they, and, they, and look at the Joel data. There was everything in place today in the, quote, data-dependent Fed to tell them to quit, at least pause. And then let's see what happens and see if we get a couple or three months where this develops into a trend. Instead, they say, let's ignore all that data and let's raise again and wait till June and July. And so I said, I've been saying a long time, May, June, and July will be the important three-month period here this year to see what the Fed does. And what did they do last year? They realized they were wrong not to, not to start raising rates in January. They took off February for Groundhog Day to see if you saw inflation. They came back in March and did a token quarter point because they didn't want to spook the bond market. They take April off every year for spring break. And then they came back in May and they said, oh my God, there is inflation, 50, 75, 75, 75. That's what I'm worried about is they're misreading this again and they're going to make the wrong moves. Um, but generally, I don't know on this Fed. They can't, they, you know, transitory, not transitory, no inflation. Forget we ever said transitory. Their credibility is shot. So I, you know, I think they've got to see a, at least a couple or three months here, or they got to just see total massive economic destruction, small business failures. You know, the jolt data can, you know, uh, convert into unemployment numbers, which is going to take months. I just don't think these people can know how to connect the dots. They're academics. They never made a loan, broke a loan, fixed a loan, managed a payroll, started a business, ended a business. They have no clue, but they're setting policy. It scares the hell out of me. <laughs> that, that does sound very scary. Um, and since we're running out of time, there's one last one by Winnie. Uh, KB Home just announced Q1 results that cancellation rate improved from 68% to 36%, same as other home builders. Do you think there is still a crash coming? And uh, DR Horton also said three days ago that cancellation rate for the first three months of 2023 came in at 18% down from the 27% rate just one quarter earlier. Yeah, so it's the timing of when those homes get completed. So that can come down because they were rushing to get completions done earlier in the spring. So they'd have the cash flow for those earnings and to take down more land. And so there's a lot of timing. So you'll see these builders are primed. They have a lot of deliveries that are coming in May and June. And I think those could be more like a saw blade where they bounce around. And DR Horton is the one I'm most concerned about because their business model is spec building, uh, unlike a, a KB Homes, which is a pre-sale. And then just look at with the Fed raising rates, what happens to mortgage rates is harder for that person to still buy that house. So what I'm seeing, for example, here in the Southeast Atlanta, North Carolina, is those people that had contracted for six to $800,000 homes and were underwritten for that, and now they fall out, they're jumping down under 500,000. So who's the builder? Who's the local, regional, or other public builder that can help them pivot from six to 800,000 to four to 500,000? That's possibly where DR Horton, they're a beneficiary they build less expensive compared to a KB home. So they may be a beneficiary of that free fall out of a KB into theirs. So it's going to be choppy. Town market here, but really, truly appreciate everything that you have shared with us with your research with us today on the webinar. Um, and thank you to everyone with us today for attending. As a reminder, the recording and also the presentation will be emailed to you. And if you're not already a CSAM Institute member, 
or course participant. So take a moment to sign up on um, for our for our e-newsletter at ccim.com to stay informed about the complimentary webinars just like this one. Also, we have other professional development opportunities as well. And I also want to encourage everyone to get in touch with the chapter in your area because we are so proud that to have the most generous and high performing commercial real estate professionals who are passionate to help you elevate you and also our communities to thrive in the commercial real estate industry. Um, thank you again, and I hope you guys enjoy this webinar. Take care and have a great day. Go have an ice cream, Bill. <laughs> ah, that's right. We should. <laughs> it's actually kind of cold over here, though. <laughs> yeah, in Hawaii and California, great ice cream. So you, you get you're the dairy state in California, right? You produce most of our good milk. So go have an ice cream, Bill. It's the best advice I give you. Get a brain freeze. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds great. Thank you so much, Casey. Again. Take care. Thank you all.